In this video, I'll introduce you to central bank digital currencies, also known as CBDCs. Then, I'll talk about the various characteristics of CBDCs and talk about the pros and cons of CBDCs. Finally, I'll describe some of the CBDCs that currently exist and some that are in pilot programs. So, what is a central bank digital currency? Well, it's a digital form of a country's fiat currency that's available to the public. Many countries have begun research into or development of CBDCs. These currently include both developed and developing economies, and CBDCs are similar to already existing crypto assets in that they're built on a blockchain. The development of CBDCs is overseen by the country's central bank. Just like fiat currency, CBDCs are backed by faith in the issuing country's government. This means that if there are any issues in the code that allow wallets to be hacked, or there are any other issues that lead to the government being unable to meet its obligations, we could expect investors to exchange their CBDCs for other currencies. That low demand for CBDCs could lead to the depreciation in the hard fiat version of the currency. Now, there's a lot of benefits to CBDCs. First, they can be treated like a digital form of cash. The CBDC could easily be used for goods and services the same way Google Pay is, via a QR code. Second, a central bank can ensure that every citizen or every person in the economy has a digital wallet. This could have the benefit of increasing financial inclusion, since people who are unable to open a checking or savings account would be able to store their funds in their wallet. Several countries, including Uruguay, have made this a priority for their CBDC. There would also be relatively low maintenance costs, since just like blockchain-based digital assets, wallet holders could hold their private keys and thus Funds couldn't be transferred out of the account without their consent, assuming only they know their private key. Next, in the case of a financial crisis or global pandemic, the central bank could easily and cheaply deposit additional funds in select wallets via an airdrop. If there's a natural disaster, the central bank could airdrop funds directly into the wallets of people in the region most affected. And finally, the characteristics of a CBDC can be adjusted to meet the needs of the country's population. If the government wants to link CBDC wallets with tax records, they could create a KYC or Know Your Customer requirement where people must register at partner banks. There are many other characteristics that can be incorporated into a CBDC that I'll talk about a little later. However, there are also some drawbacks to CBDCs. First, there could be privacy concerns. Since you have a wallet with a central bank, the government would know your balance and transaction history. This could be problematic in countries with authoritarian regimes or a weak rule of law. Next, CBDCs could be subject to increased risk of theft if someone managed to find out your private key or seed phrase and then used it to drain your account. If a CBDC did become popular, it could make it less likely that people want to use the hard currency or paper bills. It could be the case that stores stop holding enough cash to be able to provide those who use the hard currency with the appropriate amount of change for their fiat currency. And then finally, there could be some cannibalization in the financial sector, since people's digital wallets would partially take the place of a checking or savings account at a private bank. This could lead to a loss of capital at various banks and could lead to a contraction in the banking industry. Certainly, it could speed up the consolidation of the banking industry. So now that we know some of the pros and cons of CBDCs, I think it's important to discuss the Federal Reserve's opinion on them. First, the Federal Reserve believes that any potential U.S. CBDC should provide benefits to households, businesses, and the overall economy that exceed any costs and risks. Although developing a CBDC with the ideal characteristics to represent the digital version of the world's most popular currency will take time, uh, the sheer number of benefits I mentioned earlier are likely to outweigh the drawbacks. Second, simply creating a CBDC won't be beneficial if there are other private or foreign-developed digital assets. For example, if the ETH, Ethereum's native asset, suddenly became widely adopted and offered users benefits that the U.S. CBDC might also provide, it might not be worth it for the Fed to roll out a CBDC that they'll have to maintain. Third, the Fed has stated that the CBDC should complement rather than replace current forms of money, and methods of providing financial services. As of right now, the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. 
If criminals in a third world country want to engage in a transaction using a currency that's relatively stable in value, they often use US dollars. When the North Korean government counterfeits currency, it's often the US $20 bill or $100 bill that, that's being counterfeited. And for good reason. The US dollar is a medium of exchange not just in the US. Also, while a US CBDC could capture deposit funds from US banks, it won't necessarily pay interest, and the Fed is unlikely to offer the additional services that private banks provide. The next goal of the theoretical CBDC should be to protect consumer privacy. This means there's a good chance that if the US CBDC gets developed, other federal or municipal agencies might not have access to the transaction history or the wallet balances of customers. The CBDC should also protect against criminal activity. Unfortunately, hard US dollars are frequently used in criminal activity. In fact, the world's most widely counterfeited currency is the US dollar, with approximately 147 million in counterfeit bills expected to be circulating as of 2015. The next most widely counterfeited currency as of 2015 was the British pound, with approximately 7.5 million pounds confiscated. So there's obviously a big difference here between the popularity of the US dollar and the British pound. Finally, in order to successfully roll out a CBDC, the Fed has sought feedback from potential stakeholders, including US citizens. Representatives from many financial institutions have weighed in on the development and characteristics of a CBDC. The hope is that over time, the Fed will nail down the ideal characteristics for the U.S. population that allow the currency to retain its status as the world's reserve currency. Now let's talk about the characteristics that the Fed is weighing incorporating into a possible CBDC. First, it's attempting to determine whether the CBDC should be interest-bearing or not. If you deposit funds in your digital wallet, an interest-bearing CBDC could involve an airdrop of additional units into your account corresponding with an appropriate interest rate. This could have a couple of side effects, though. First, given the low interest rate on bank deposits, an interest-bearing CBDC could incentivize banks to raise rates that they offer to depositors, or it could incentivize them to cut fees in order to compete with the CBDC. A non-interest-bearing CBDC would simply be stored, Given that in most time periods, inflation is positive, this would mean that the real value of funds in your wallet would decrease. Second, there's an open question of whether the CBDC should be treated like cash and be anonymous, or it should be treated like a deposit account. If the CBDC was treated like cash, then anyone could open a wallet and store funds there anonymously. The upside is that wallets could be opened with the ease that Bitcoin or ETH wallets are opened. And, as we've seen recently, if people are making regular transactions using a digital wallet, it's possible to determine who actually owns that wallet. However, it's unlikely the CBDC is going to be treated like cash, since the U.S. has know-your-customer regulations. Since banks must know information about their clients, it's likely that a CBDC that cannibalizes funds from banks would have some kind of know-your-customer requirement attached. This means that it's more likely that the CBDC would be treated like a deposit account, with the Federal Reserve knowing who opened each account and some identifying information about that person. Now, these accounts would obviously not be anonymous. So, given that the CBDC is more likely to be treated like a depository account, similar to a checking account or a savings account, let's talk about the impact this would have on traditional banks. There were 4,236 commercial banking institutions in the United States at the end of 2021. This number has been declining for decades as the financial sector has become more deregulated and regulatory costs have increased. However, relatively speaking, the U.S. is extremely well banked. Other countries have relatively fewer banks. In fact, there were only a few hundred banks in Japan as of January of 2022, despite the country having a population of approximately 126 million people. In other countries, there are even fewer traditional banks. Notice that in many emerging markets, the number of bank branches per 100,000 people is quite low. People in these countries are often considered unbanked since they're unlikely to be able to access traditional banking services. It's in these countries where a CBDC would be most beneficial, assuming the cellular infrastructure was good. 
In the US and Western Europe, banking services are widely available, and the market is quite competitive. This means that the introduction of a CBDC is, as I said earlier, likely to lead to cannibalization of deposits from banks in these countries. Since a deposit account like CBDC would allow people to deposit funds without paying a monthly fee, traditional banks would likely have to reduce fees to compete. This means smaller margins, potentially smaller transfer and overdraft fees, and likely greater consolidation. And this leads to the last likely impact. Traditional banks that stand to lose a lot are likely to lobby hard against a US CBDC. The American Bankers Association and the Bank Policy Institute have already responded to the Fed's call for comments and stated that a CBDC would make credit less available to firms and individuals, given the potential reduction in traditional banks. How accurate this statement is remains to be seen. Now, despite the reduction in credit availability, there is certainly one group of people who would benefit the most from a CBDC, and that's the unbanked. Any person that requests an account could receive one. One of the biggest reasons why people don't have access to a bank account is because of poor credit history. They might have too many bounce checks or overdrafts. However, with the CBDC built on the blockchain, people could only spend the funds that are in their digital wallet. This means that these accounts could be kept open indefinitely. The other incredible social benefit of a CBDC is the possibility of an airdrop. As I stated earlier, airdrops allow the Fed to deposit a certain amount of tokens or CBDC into someone's account. If someone is drawing social security or let's say they're in a region affected by a hurricane, airdrops could be an incredibly simple way to transfer funds from the federal government to those individuals without a middleman. It's hard to overstate just how valuable an airdrop might be for wallet holders. In countries with large populations that receive government benefits, airdrops would reduce the waste in terms of paperwork, time, and funds. Overall, government efficiency could be increased by the introduction of a deposit like CBDC. First, the use of a wallet assigned to each person could reduce the possibility of fraud. We've recently seen a significant amount of fraud related to the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, and the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, or EIDL, programs. If the federal government had an account for each person who was requesting funds under these programs, it would be simpler to ensure that the person who requested those federal funds was the person receiving those funds. Second, wallets could be tied to tax records to both determine income and handle tax refunds. There are several benefits here, though the biggest benefit is to ensure that the refunds are transferred to the correct account. It could also be possible to link outside accounts to a person's CBDC wallet in the case of money laundering or in cases where the DOJ needs to determine the owner of an account. Finally, employers could deposit funds directly to a CBDC account, making it easy to switch between banks or even move without having to worry about whether your paycheck is lost in the mail. So, what countries are in the process of developing CBDCs? Well, there's a large number of countries that are currently considering CBDCs. Uh, right now, the leaders on that front are the ones in blue, and um, admittedly, there are very few of these. We have down here, uh, the Bahamas was the first country to launch a, a full CBDC, followed by Jamaica. There are, however, a lot of pilot programs from countries that are essentially determining what characteristics to have in their CBDC and testing out those characteristics. So France is a good example here. Canada has uh, Jasper, which is in the pilot program. But most countries are still in the research process or even just in the proof of concept process. And I, I would expect in the next five to 10 years, a large number of CBDCs are gonna be rolled out, uh, many with different characteristics. Now let's talk about the Bahamian dollar, the sand dollar. Uh, the sand dollar is the digital version of the Bahamian dollar. As the first CBDC, it's received a large amount of interest. When it was rolled out, any investor of the Bahamas could use it. Any merchant could accept the CBDC and people could use it via their cell phone, which approximately 90% of residents had. People could create a wallet by stopping by any authorized bank, and the use of the sand dollar certainly corresponded to an increase in financial access amongst Bahamians. 
Because it's pegged to the Bahamian dollar, which is pegged to the U.S. dollar, the price of the sand dollar is very close to one U.S. dollar at all times. As of yet, we really haven't seen any large cases of fraud or hacking either. Now, the next CBDC development program that you need to be aware of is the Digital Yuan, also referred to as the ECNY, so E Chinese Yuan. Just like with the sand dollar, the wallets for the Digital Yuan are treated like depository accounts, meaning that each is affiliated with a known individual. This CBDC just like the sand dollar, is backed by bank reserves and faith in the Chinese government, or the government at hand. Although it's still in the pilot stage, the central government announced this month that it's going to expand the trial to four additional provinces, meaning that more than 360 million people would be able to use the pilot version. Now, I personally think it's going to be interesting to watch the relationship between the digital yuan and Alipay. In May, both Alipay and WeChat allowed people to download the digital yuan wallet and use it, assuming they were in the pilot program. However, it's unclear how widespread the adoption of the digital yuan will be over the next few years, though the central government could incentivize people to use it. So how does the digital yuan work? Well, if you're interested in a video that shows you how it works, feel free to click this link and it'll show you how citizens in China are using the digital yuan right now. In essence, it operates very similar to Alipay. However, the fees on the digital yuan are significantly lower than those of Alipay. There are privacy concerns with respect to the digital yuan though, and as of right now, it has the option to expire, which is kind of crazy. This possible expiration date could be beneficial for incentivizing people to spend the currency. So if you don't spend it, you lose it. You know, use it or lose it. As of right now, the digital yuan has several benefits. It's a new form of payment that can be used at any retailer, and because it's a deposit account, it'll allow for the collection of transaction data, which could likely increase crime detection. It should also reduce fees when it's fully rolled out. And finally, it could make international trades faster and cheaper and allow Chinese firms to make transactions without using the U.S. dollar, which is the currency of choice for international transactions. For all of these positives, however, there are some drawbacks. First, there's the lack of anonymity, which could be bad in an authoritarian regime. Just like in the US, private firms that provide payment systems will likely suffer as well. Since Alibaba and Tencent provide comparable products, it's very likely these firms could be harmed by the full rollout of the digital yuan. However, this could incentivize those firms to find new financial products and services to provide, if only to separate their products and services from that of the digital yuan. Now there's actually very few countries that have launched pilot programs as of the time I'm recording this video. In fact, I count two countries that have fully rolled out CBDCs, those being the Bahamas and Jamaica, and only 12 countries with pilot programs, including Nigeria. So let's talk about Nigeria's pilot CBDC. The pilot for the electronic version of the Naira, uh, Nigeria's currency, was launched less than a year ago, in October of 2021. Just like most CBDCs, one major goal was to increase financial inclusion. To create a wallet, anyone with a cell phone could scan a QR code or type star 997 pound. The digital currency doesn't pay interest, which provides Nigerian banks with an advantage when competing for funds. Interestingly, the growth of accounts has actually been quite low with the total number of wallets increasing by only 100,000 in 2022, despite the country having more than 200 million citizens. Now, there's one final project I want to note since we're talking about CBDCs. The Bank for International Settlements, whose goal is to promote global monetary and financial stability through international cooperation, has begun a project called Multiple CBDC Bridge, or MCBDC Bridge. This bridge is being developed as a platform that allows for the low-cost exchange of multiple CBDCs. In essence, as of right now, it's expected to work like a decentralized exchange. This project was initiated to reduce the inefficiencies, high costs, and complex regulatory requirements associated with cross-border payments. Many central banks and international organizations have joined this project. So, 
what impact is the development of CBDCs having on the U.S. currency, the dollar? Well, as I said earlier, the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. It's used in the majority of international transactions, and assets in U.S. financial institutions represent approximately a quarter of total assets in financial institutions worldwide. This means that non-U.S. banks can be pressured into refusing to do business with certain entities or individuals since the alternative is losing access to the U.S. financial system. Countries such as Iran and North Korea have effectively been cut off from foreign banks. However, the development of CBDCs represents a threat to this dominance, since a CBDC or MCBDC bridge could facilitate low-cost fund transfers and reduce the U.S.'s ability to enforce sanctions like those against Iran. If one country's digital currency increases in popularity, this currency could become a rival currency to the U.S. dollar, which could reduce the effectiveness of U.S. sanctions. So that's that. Now, let's summarize. So CBDCs are being developed by a large percentage of the world's central banks. These include the central banks of the United States, France, Canada, Australia, etc., etc. And CBDCs can incorporate a variety of characteristics based on their needs and their population's needs. There are several pilot programs or fully rolled out CBDCs in existence, and two of those are the eNaira and the Sand Dollar. And finally, the U.S. CBDC does appear to be several years away from a full rollout. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, and I suppose I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.